time for the visit with the person of high strangeness. Um, the travel shows are so popular um, and um, since I can only be in one place at one time or so it seems, um, I had put out a, a cry or a, um, a plea to, to the friends and the viewers that if they go on a trip to please uh, take us along and uh, film for us. And so we've been really lucky. We've had uh, international reporters and we've been to Yuma. And today uh, we're going to go to, uh, uh, to the western part of Arizona and some other goody places uh, with our friend uh, Laura Johnson. And she, um, uh, she, there was a winter vacation for her and I'm going to introduce you to her real quick because she's going to tell you in two or three words how come it was a journey instead of a trip and uh, so we have a lot of footage, we have a lot of things to take you to. So I'd like for you to uh, say hi to Lori Johnson. How are you, Lori? Just fine. Thanks for having me. Yeah. A lot of work you did for us there, huh? Well, it actually was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. So, And uh, what we did is instead of just going straight down I-5 and going straight to see our relatives, we decided to take some side trips and see some of our national parks. Uh -huh. So it entailed seven states, a lot of national parks, and a lot of nice, fun experiences. And it was good for us because, uh, no, I don't have to go there because we've already <laughs> taken you there. So I think without any delay, uh, we had so many inserts. We spent several hours on, um, so without any delay, we're going to go right along with your trip that um, turned out to be a journey. Okay. Cool. So this is Black Stanley, and he went we on our trip with us. Stanley. What started out to be a trip, later to be a voyage. The whole purpose of Flat Stanley is he's a third grade class project out of a Renton school that he sent to stay with people and to travel with people for one week. And then things are sent back to the school and the children then look up where Flat Stanley has been and they learn a little bit about geography and where Flat Stanley has visited and the history. Behind him here is Mount Shasta that you see. This is where we started out in Grants Pass, Oregon on the Rogue River is where we stayed. And then onto the Rogue River, you'll see this is one of the jet boats that comes right in front of the Riverside Inn and will pick up passengers and take them up the river. And they will have one, even two day excursions, which is also quite interesting is they still deliver the mail this way by jet boats, not this particular type, but another type. And that's the only way people get their mail. And this is what's really interesting about the Rogue River. If you stay at this particular resort, you have bridges on both sides of you, and on the opposite side, right where you're looking, right where the flag is, there's actually a park that you can go. And so there's so many festivities and so many things that people can enjoy, even if you do not stay at the resort. But it is unique that one direction of the road will go through Grants Pass on one side of the river and back on the other side, as you'll see that bridge. As you can see, this is really a fierce animal. Um, this is my, my bass and hound white that comes with us and travels. Um, what we found quite interesting though that the Indians that lived along the Rogue River were termed fierce and that's why they were frequently referred to as the rogues because of their willingness to fight for their rights. Also too, Josephine County, which this um, the Rogue River and Grants Pass lies in, was the only county in the state of Oregon in name of an honor of a woman, which her name is Josephine Rollins. Okay, well that kind of goes along with uh, the rogue castles that we just showed you here a few weeks ago. Your vicious dog, wow. Now this is um, in Sacramento. This is right where the American and the Sacramento River fork and they actually meet. And it was a beautiful, beautiful park down below. And people are actually fishing down there and they catch quite a few fish and other types of just relaxing activities go about there. Now this is the state capital of California, which is Sacramento. Um, beautiful, beautiful building. Actually, Sacramento is known to have one of the most versatile type of architecture in the United States. So we decided to take Flat Stanley here so he could see the capital. Well, yeah, the capital was sliding here. Yes, it'd be in Sacramento, and we just watched 10.5. I guess we got Stanley here to hold up the capital, huh? <laughs> so true. So true. 
Okay. And here shows a little bit of the versatile architecture of Sacramento, which was one of the reasons why we wanted to go there, is to see the different types of buildings. This is just one example. There were so many and just not enough film in my camera. Oh, time on this show. And um, this was here was taken up at Yosemite's village. It was one of the very few ravens I've actually saw in my life and he just sat there and watched me and as I got closer he actually flew away so I just got him in flight but I was quite fascinated actually being able to see one because around here we only see crows. Now this was also up at Yosemite's in the village. This is the Awani Hotel known to be one of America's most beautiful hotels. Um, the scenery around it was absolutely breathtaking with the snow still on the ground in the fields and this time of year it's very unusual to see the wildlife that we did see during that time. Now, now this is Flat Stanley. This was after our day going up to Yosemite Village up at Yosemite National Park. As you can see he's just relaxing next to the Merced River and in the next picture that you're going to see you'll actually be able to see the trout down in the river. Now this is the Merced River, and as we were looking down over our balcony, you could see trout actually swimming down there. Unfortunately, with a photo, all you're seeing is little black specks, but they're actually quite large fish. And again, too, this is an area where you must catch and release, so you can't actually take them and cook them up. Oh. Too bad. <laughs> now in the springtime, the size of this rock is about the size of a Volkswagen. And what we were told during the spring melt-off, that these boulders are so loud that you can't even hear the water, which at that time was loud, because of the, the rumbling and the rolling and tumbling of these huge, huge boulders coming down the river as the spring melt-off. But again, you can see the size of one of these, and it might not be there next year if they have a big, huge flood, and it will wash it down. Now, as you can see, this is the actual entrance into Yosemite National Park. And so it is quite a limited for size, so not all rigs, especially if you're taller than 13 feet, are going to be able to get through here. Oh, but I didn't get through there. I'm 10 something. Well, cool. then, then you're lucky. You can yeah. make it then, Lillian. How interesting. And again, you'll see Flat Stanley down there on the roadside. Okay. Well, there's Stanley sitting, well, at the side of the highway. Now this is coming out of Yosemite National Park, coming and heading west into El Portel. And as you can see, there's a rock. We called it duck rock because it looked like a duck. But there's a sign right before it. It says 13 feet 6 inches. If you're any taller, you're not going to have the top of your rig left. The reason they call it duck rock. This is, this is <laughs> according to Lillian here. It says duck. You got a duck. <laughs> I never thought of that one. <laughs> well, actually, in Canon Bichet, they have the hangover rock. And uh, it has to do with margarita. The original name was margarita. And of course, drinking a lot of margaritas, you get a hangover. <laughs> so they called it, um, mar oh, I'm sorry, I'm telling it backwards. It's margarita rock, and they named it the hangover because after the, so it's a duck rock. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah. Now this is back at Yosemite Park and Yosemite Village again. And as you can see, Flat Stanley, he's pointing to a gray scroll just right behind, right below his left fingers. I don't know if you can see him. He's kind of small in the picture, but he was big in person. Now, this was taken at the very beginning of March, but you can still see the amount of snow on the ground and then the waterfall in the background. There wasn't a lot of melt-off, and as it comes closer to spring or later on, like this time of year in May, April or May, you'll get bigger waterfalls because of the runoff. This was just one of the, the sites that put a smile to our face. We figured, and we called this the smallest house on Highway 140 in California. Check out the size of the truck compared to the size of the house. And in person, all you can do is smile or laugh looking at how somebody could actually live in that little house. Well, Stanley could have. Well, this is true. Good point.
There's your windmills. I kind of kind of bleeping because I brought them in as far as far as I can. Quick, yeah. quick story you hear? Yeah. Well, actually, in Tehachapi, this is one of their sources of power, which I found quite fascinating because it's so windy through those rocks and through those mountains between Bakersfield and Needle, California. Mm -hmm. We know about the wind. Okay. Okay. Now we're in Parker. Now this particular dock that you're seeing here is where we actually pulled up and we ate lunch. Um, my father and my stepmother actually have a winter place there that they stay in and they have a party barge that they can go to the casino, they can go to swap meets, they can go shopping and of course then they can go to lunch. So this is where we went to lunch and in the background Yeah, and that was the end of the club. It, oh, look, isn't that pretty there? That, that piece of the clip actually gave us a hard time, didn't it, Miss yeah, Laurie? It yeah. did. Do you remember why? Yeah, because I kept getting my fingers in the way. <laughs> Her fingers, that's what it was. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, Every time I put the, the picture up on the board, I was taking them down too, too fast or not fast enough. So. Oh, well, let me fill you in on a secret. What happened is you didn't take a camera, did you? I didn't take a movie camera. No video. No, yeah, no video. You, all this was done off of Instamatic, Instamatic throwaway disposable cheap cameras. We so. did, yeah. yeah. And so, but it came out really, really good. And um, so, with a little magic, we turned it into a movie type thing. Anyway, we got a long ways to go. So we're going to go to the next clip, um, which is longer than this one. And we're going to where we're we going. From Parker, um, I think we go to Phoenix in that area. To Phoenix, yeah, that's where the um, UFO goodies and everything comes in. So enjoy, and uh, um, with our next clip going to Phoenix and, and beyond. Yep. All the places I'm not going to take you to because it's just not safe for me to go there. Okay, are we ready? Cool. Oh, Arizona and California, are. some of the most fertile agricultural land and they have such a big versatility of the different crops that they grow from cotton to lettuce, cauliflower, broccoli and of course they're known for their dates and their peanuts there also. I got dates, didn't I? They're good? Yeah, they were they? Yes, they were. Cool. Now Yuma is also home to the territorial prison there in Yuma which I believe you just did a show on. Not yeah, so we did a whole show on that on the prison, so. You wouldn't want to do anything wrong there. I don't think they did. Uh, if you remember all those graveyards, a lot of people died there. You bet. Hey, those special effects are on your photograph, and we are now where? This is the Sonoran National Monument. Um, we actually looked for a monument, couldn't find it, so I guess that the cactuses themselves must represent the monuments themselves. I don't know. I see something in my little viewfinder here. Let's go in. Maybe this is the monument. Whoops, I'm sorry. Let's see what this could be. I don't know. Looks like a something. Well, it was between Yuma and here that we actually saw the UFO the night before, which is quite interesting phenomenon. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, it, it, before the oh, show ends, I want to talk about that for a minute, okay? So, cool. Let's go there. Yeah, uh, that could be the monument there in the back. What do you think? Probably. Mm -hmm. Flat Stan probably knows better than we do since he's pointing at it, so I think that might be it. That might I wasn't be. quite sure. I figured something more. Um, signified with a big sign or something in front of it. Well, you keep in mind a lot of these things were landmarks for the people, the natives that lived there. So it didn't really have to be so tremendous. They know what it was. It's like for us, we talk about uh, uh, the Fourth Avenue Bridge or the brewery. So it's not a huge thing, but we all can relate to it. This is true. And that would be a yeah. good landmark mm -hmm. by the the, the if you're Absolutely. lost, I guess it's visible. Yeah. yeah. So we we don't know about that, so call us if you know. And these are? 
These are the wildflowers that we heard so much about that you don't see very often in too many years because they don't get very much rainfall. This particular spring we went down there, they had a lot of rain. And so we got to see these in bloom, which I guess is quite a rarity. Here in Washington, we see weeds is what we call them, but I guess they're called wildflowers down there. Cool. Now this was something very unusual. As we were coming into Phoenix, um, we noticed that there was a whole bunch of police cars escorting something, and then all of a sudden there's this big, huge box that takes up two lanes. Behind it is a whole another slew of police cars. But again, this big box was totally unmarked. Um, it wasn't a government official type truck that was hauling it. It just looked like a regular truck. But by the time I got my camera on, as you can see, all you can see was a little trail of cars behind it, which were actually police cars. Now here, we saw another box going in the opposite direction, actually. And it was in front of us, and I wasn't sure if it would turn off before we could actually see again what it was. But once again, it was another big, huge box that was totally unmarked, taking up two lanes. Yeah, it's probably going to one of those secret, well, you know, to things to the places that don't exist. Yeah, it's given the location where that box thing is. Yeah, and, and as you can see, how big it is now as we came up closer to it. And again, there's no markings. It's just like they used plywood and just made a big box and put something in it. But it was big enough to take up two lanes and obviously important enough for having police escorts in front and back. Aliens. Told you it was aliens. <laughs> Well, what I thought was interesting about this is there was no clouds in the sky except for this. So that's what just prompted me to take the picture because I thought it was so unique and so unusual. I've never seen a cloud quite like that up here in Washington State. Well, actually they have them on Mount Rainier, but they call it the weather phenomenon. In some circles we think that is where they cloak, they, um, whoever they are, unidentified. And, um, and we could call those scalar clouds. So oh, that's what you got. Oh, your four clouds. That's what they called. So cool. And that's your husband's nose right there. Right. That's right. Change the scenery. Yep. Now we're going north into Arizona. We've left Air Phoenix and we're going on our way to Flagstaff. But prior to that, on the way, there is the Montezuma Castle, which were actually cliff dwellers. I believe they were the Sinequa Indians that lived there. And... Cool, I'm gonna see. There you go, give a whole area all here. Okay. Now this is the Montezuma Well, which is a very unusual phenomenon because it's a lake in the middle of the desert, but this is where they got their water source. Look at the blue, it's beautiful. It's like an oasis in the middle of the desert is what they refer to it as. Now this is Walnut Canyon. Again, another area of the cliff dwellers, a different sort. They were also known as the people without water in that they lived here more than 800 years ago. Now this gives you a little bit closer view as to what the actual dwellings look like. Cool. Let me see if I can get that another. That actually comes out of the very many um, uh, for sure it's thinking about, no? Yeah. Pretty. Very pretty. Well, this comes out of the uh, the brochure you picked up, so that might be what it might have looked like, no? Well, if you were born scared of heights, you had just had a problem all your life. A psychiatrist would have had a field day with that, huh? <laughs> Treating a phobia of heights when you live up there. Oh, my. Now this is one of their Pueblo sites, the, what's left of it, the ruins, which is actually up on the hill, so you didn't have to go down 
and go into those cliffs or subject yourself to the heights. So I guess these would be the ones that had the problem with the heights. They would live here. Cool, yeah. <laughs> People like me. <laughs> I'd live there. Weird way, yeah. <laughs> Now this is Sunset Crater Volcano, and as you can see, the different um, black color, which is actually your, your lava rock. Very interesting terrain. I wouldn't expect to see a volcano in the middle of the desert, but it was pretty fascinating. And it was there where the Opotki Indians made and established their dwellings, and you'll see that in the next shots. Now this is the Wapotki Ruins. And again, like I had said, it was very close to the, the volcano. And they actually have a blowhole, which I have a, a better picture of that you'll see next. But they were able to tell what the atmosphere and the weather was going to do by this blowhole. It would, with high pressure, it would blow out. Low pressure, it would suck in. Use it for networking, too. That was what I, I was looking for, one of my... The people I interviewed on the highway said that they used it for networking, that they were the originator of networking communities. Now this is the blowhole. This is where they actually sat around and they could decide what the weather was going to be like. And as you can see, the rest of the, the ruins in the background. They had quite a civilization there and quite a community. Did it say if it was man-made or it just happened? Well, the actual blowhole was from a lava tube created by the volcano that was right there. Cool. Now here's another picture of the Wapotki ruins. What I found was quite fascinating and interesting of this particular building is that you can see the huge boulder in the center. They actually built the building around the huge boulder and it still is intact to this day, which I thought was quite beautiful and intriguing at the same time. Now again, here's another rock that was right there at the Wapaki ruins. And again, it was incorporated into their little village and I thought it was so beautiful with all the little tiny holes. It almost reminds me of wormholes that we would find in wood on the beach here in Washington State. What it reminds me of is uh, when the termites go through the didgeridoos, uh, to, to the wood, and leave the carvings for the sound. So maybe the wind made different sounds. Could be. I just found them so unique because it's not anything that you see around in this area as far as the rock formations. Well, now this will give you an overall view of what the actual community looked like and where each thing was stationed within their little community or their little town. And again, you'll see the, the blowhole. They actually even had a ball court, a community room, and then they had various living quarters and kitchens, just like what we have today. Yeah, and as you can see, um, it came off of one of those uh, guides. Yeah. Cool. Came from the visitor center. Now this is the Painted Desert, also the Petrified Forest, um, going east on Highway 40 in northern Arizona. And if you look really close, there's little dots because we're so far away, but those dots, as you'll see in the next pictures, are actually the, the wood in the forest that's left behind. The petrified wood, of course. Of course. <laughs> now, is that actually laying on the ground? Or? Yes, it's, they're all laying on the ground. Of course, nothing is upright. Um, I'm not quite sure how many years ago that there was the forest, but all that remains now is this um, forest a corpse is actually what it's turned into through the years of the process of basic, I guess, mummifying the, <laughs> the logs. Nature's way of mummifying the logs. How's that? Yeah, cool. Why well, I saw that. It's so beautiful. I said a bad word, didn't I? <laughs> Yawn. Okay, well, actually, as you can see, 
the different wood, which I was quite interesting, or it was interesting for me to find out, is that different woods actually dried in different colors. So whether or not maybe they had cedars and maybe they had oak back then, and as each one um, was petrified, it turned into a different color. And I actually have some of those that were given to me by my mother-in-law that she's had them for years and years. So it was pretty fun. Um, we had taken you to um, a slideshow with the range, and, and that was one of the, the petrified pieces that he showed you, and that's are some of the things that you'll see there in the Petrified Forest National Park. Here's a different view of the same thing. And here we're showing you a camp trail. Well, that's what it would appear to be. In reality, we're trying to draw your attention to what's on the bottom here. What is it, Lori? It's a train. In the middle of nowhere. Yeah, and I thought they didn't have trains going through national parks, but I guess they do. I guess they do. It's probably going to that place that doesn't <laughs> exist, huh? <laughs> Could be. Yeah. Well, look what we got here. Another raven. Another the raven. The second one on my trip. Uh, by that time, had you figured it was, there was a reason? I think so. Well, good. I thought there was a reason. Look how beautiful it is. Let me see if I can make it bigger for you. It's just beautiful just sitting there. Cool. And unlike our birds, the two ravens that I saw, neither one of them seemed to be afraid of me. They allowed me to come right up, and I have one of those inexpensive, cheap disposables, so as you can see, I had to have been pretty darn close to them. Mm-hmm. Well, they came to tell you something. And we are now where? This is Holbrook, and I found it interesting because I was trying to find the TP Hotel that was in the AAA book, and I didn't find it, but in order to come out of the National Park, you must come through Holbrook. And as you come through Holbrook, you actually pass this. So I had to get a picture of it because it still existed and I thought it was so unique. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Right. Here we are now where? Now this is Meteor City. It lays right in the middle of Highway 40 between Flagstaff and on your way to the Petrified Forest. And it looks so unique, so we went in there and it has some of the, the best um, Native American artifacts and trinkets and just things that are made from the Native American people in that area. And good prices, I might add. Now this is at Hambali State Park, again on Highway 40. Um, I found it quite fascinating because when we came in there, it gave really no directions, but when we came across this one little area to park, it said danger quicksand. And I had never seen quicksand before, and of course I wasn't going to go out there and try it out, but I found it quite fascinating. And that's a quicksand. Now, in Canada, say you have quicksand too. Really? Mm -hmm. And it looks so wonderful. And then, bam! <laughs> and you're gone. And you're gone, <laughs> yeah. And that? Now this again is at the Humbali State Park. This was actually the Hambali ruins, which we weren't aware until I think after the fact they weren't supposed to be there. You can, oops. Yep, totally mm -hmm. oops. Yeah. And I thought it was a little bit interesting. It looked like an archaeological dig. They had holes and visqueen and things kind of marked off, but they didn't have any signs and nothing was um, roped off at all. They didn't so, know he was coming. That's why. This <laughs> is true, but it was very interesting. Some of the, the artifacts there and the pieces of pottery. Mm -hmm. There's some, yeah, I got out of yeah. last year. Very, very bad fires. And I didn't realize just the devastation, nor did I realize that there was actually forest in Arizona to burn until we headed north. And mm -hmm. this, again, is just right outside of Flagstaff, going towards your Grand Canyon. And it was amazing how much of the forest had actually burned. Yeah, we, when we came, we were quite a ways away from it, but we couldn't see. And the smoke and uh, the people, they had evacuate people all the way over to uh, New Mexico. It's just, just uh, I always tell people, go on the back roads, you know, but keep in mind, if there's a problem, keep on your radio, because if you run yourself in a forest fire, 
that's another story. Mm -hmm. right. And actually, this was more the back roads. This was Highway 180. Oh. Going up towards the Grand Canyon out of Flagstaff. Uh -huh. So even at that, you need to make sure yeah. and be careful of any type of fires that might be happening in the area. Okay. Now this is Oak Creek Canyon, and this is Highway 89A coming from Flagstaff down into Sedona. It was ranked as one of the top 10 roads in America for scenic beauty. Absolutely beautiful. I would recommend to take a motorhome or somebody with a truck and trailer because it's such steep grade, down nine miles of switchbacks, but absolutely breathtaking views. And when you come down closer into Sedona, you see the red rocks that Sedona is so famous for. Okay, we're now down the hill. This, yeah. yeah. Yep, now we're in Page. Actually, this is looking over the Glen Canyon Dam with Lake Powell in the background, it being almost dry, so you don't see much of the water right now. Now, this here is Lake Powell, and as you can see, the white around the water, which is very small and minute, is where the water level has dropped so much, and there's actually marinas that are left high and dry that are on fingers of the lake that no longer even have the water going to them. So it'd be kind of hard to launch a boat there right now this time of year. Okay. Well, that's the end of the second clip. Cool. Thanks for hanging with us here. Right. Can we look at that real quick? Okay, we're, we're done. Well, that's it. I guess that was the end of the second clip. I'm sitting here thinking, now, uh, this is actually the first time I held a piece of the petrified wood. Uh, by going there, can you imagine it having taken millions of years to get like that? It is. And what's really interesting is they actually have dinosaur footprints and evidence uh -huh. of the dinosaurs and bones there. And you don't really correlate dinosaurs with Western United States, at least I never did. Yeah. So it was really interesting because it's in the same area that all this petrified um, wood is too. Yeah, now the Four Corners area, they have a lot of dinosaur Do stuff they? here. Huh. But you know, but, th but looking at this, you think it's just a rock, but when you realize it's actually a a, a tree, and then according to some people, our history starts, what, what 6,000 years ago, 4,000. Amazing, isn't it? it? Yeah. And what's really amazing is that it's so different in structure. It is. Here, everything rots here in Washington yeah. State, so you never see anything like that. Yeah, you, can, you can tell this is what, we got one more clip to go, and then we'll chat about that. I'm just, I'm just in awe of the whole thing, now, you know, that I'm consciously looking at this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we go, we're going to go to the next clip because we're not quite done yet. We're going to go and see um, the white buffalo. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Spirit cool. Mountain. Huh? And Spirit Mountain. Yeah. In the Grand Canyon yet. Mm -hmm. Anytime we're ready, we can go. Actually, these are the canyon lands. So you go from the Zion. The hoodoos. Yeah, the hoodoos. hoodoos. We wind yeah. up. This is heavy. I'm going to put this back up here. Francisco Peaks, and it's home of the white buffalo. Quite a prophecy and legend behind the white buffalo. So to me, it was one of the most spiritual experiences that I had experienced, especially after just reading a couple of Sun Bear's book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, we do have permission to use that, so I can actually show it to you in its entirety. And then uh, this is the white buffalo. This in July one, July first, two thousand and two, and we will get back to the buffalo story later. Okay. And it's this uh, actual photograph of, um, of the white buffalo, and I was actually fortunate enough to allow it to be um, feed it. And as you can see on the fence are, are, are all the um, gifts that people have come in honor of the white buffalo. And they do change colors too, so they don't look white here, but that's because of the time of the year. And here's another picture again of um, the buffalo. There was actually four of them there at that time. Now again, this is San Francisco Peaks, but known to the Native Americans as Spirit Mountain. I mean, the noise you're hearing is from a cat sneezing. Now this is Chapel of the Holy Dove. 
Um, it's a prayer chapel that has actually been it caught on fire and they've rebuilt it five times. But it's a very spiritual place. A lot of people get married in it. Very, very small. Probably only seats maybe 20 people at the very most, if that. And again, this is the, the chapel, looking at it towards the face. Now this is the inside of the chapel. You can see how small it is. You actually almost have to duck to go inside. Beautiful, beautiful woodwork. Now again, this is the in the inside of the chapel, looking at the actual podium, and you can see Spirit Mountain in the background. Now this again is taken inside the chapel, the same position where I was before, but for some reason something appeared in the camera and I thought it was quite interesting. The reason why I had two pictures taken is because one of my cameras, I wasn't sure if it was advancing. Um, however, it did advance and this appeared on the picture. But everyone that goes inside experiences some very spiritual awareness and I thought it was quite unique that it show up in this particular picture in this particular place and time. Now this here is Miracle Moon. As you can see, his fur is a little bit whiter, so obviously it was taken closer to the winter months. Because again, as I said before, they change with the seasons. Almost like being a chameleon, so that way they are protected by their environment and people hurting them or killing them. That's not the story I heard, but that's okay. Uh, we're going to turn this picture over and show you because there's an actual business card that we have permission to show you. Bill, and here's the card for the Spirit Mountain Ranch, uh, the people that can get you in touch with all of that. Cell phones, um, um, Highway 180, and it tells you how to get there. So you can give the show a call, and we will have further information for you on that subject. And off we go. Okay, now we're coming into Utah. And as you can see, the, it almost looks as if they had to blow the rocks away in order to make the road through it. This is part of the Great Canyon Lands. Now this is looking down and out over Utah as you're coming out of Page and up into Utah. Absolutely beautiful, beautiful area, which sets up for the, the canyons. Now we're at the Grand Canyon. That's just what it is, one huge grand canyon. Now again, this is the Grand Canyon from the South Rim looking north. That's the top part because that's actually a really skinny picture. So I'm going to pan down and give you the rest of it. For the friends that bring pictures to the show, make sure that they, um, well, I would prefer them to be a certain size, so this won't be so hard on me. Cool. Now this is a skinny picture going the other way. And that's the way we like them, so you see the whole... Oh my god, it's so high. Couldn't take an RV up there either, I don't think. <laughs> Where are we now? And this is again in the Grand Canyon. Just a different outlook, a different post that they put little lookouts throughout the whole canyon rim. Mm -hmm. In the movie Grand Canyon with Danny Glover, they were talking about how you get to get in, you look there, how overwhelmed you get and realize that you're very important but very insignificant in, in the big picture by being in a setting like that. And what's very interesting about the Grand Canyon is that there's actually nine ecosystems within the canyon, which I thought was interesting and fascinating. Now this is Zion National Park. Actually probably my favorite because instead of being on top of the canyon, you are actually in the canyon. You go down and experience it. Now what you're looking at here is an actual one mile tunnel that you drive through. And in the next picture, you'll actually see the hole or the windows that allow the air to come through and circulate. But again, what you're looking at, this whole rock formation, is one mile of a tunnel. So explain, is it a natural formation or is it man-made? It is man-made. Man-made, yes. Mm -hmm. And a lot of 
hard work, it sounds like, or looks like to me. Mm -hmm. This here is actually the window while you're in the tunnel looking out, and they only allow one um, direction of traffic to go at a time. So I'm assuming they have a light? No, there is no light. You turn on your lights. No, but when do you know where to go? Uh, this must be the tunnel for psychics. <laughs> huh? You have to use your headlights. You uh -huh. go really slow. But how do you know when there's a person on the other side? They only allow one... I understand that. Now, this one's trying to confuse me. <laughs> My original question was, who determines who goes where? Of psychics, we don't need anybody. But there is three-dimensional people, and that's what they do. You have rangers standing there that knows who goes when, so you only have one time in there, one car in there at a time. One direction, a whole one slew direction. of cars. One direction. Uh-huh. can go through? Certain size. Uh-oh. -uh. Only certain sizes. So this might be the only time you get to see that. I'm not going there. So that's what's at the other end of the tunnel. Actually, those are windows looking out of the tunnel while you're going through the tunnel. Oh, they got windows. Yeah, oh, they have actual openings, and you'll see that in the next picture here. Okay. Well, there's the window. I, they don't have lights. Let me show you that little window here. Do they have light in there? Nope. No light? No light, except from those little windows. And there's about, I think, three or four of those. Oh. Now, I'm not going there. <laughs> well, let me give you a broader shot here. Wow. Okay, now on the other side of the tunnel, you come to this, which is called the checkerboard mesa. Now that's one of those long pictures, so I have to, uh, um, of course, do it in two pieces. So I'll go up and try to show you the rest of it. There you go. There you have it. Oops, I went too far. Well, that's okay. We can include this uh, clip with this map, and so tell us what's where. Okay, this is where you come in from the You have the to speak loud. This is where you come in from the east. You go through one small tunnel. The big tunnel that we took you through, the one mile, is right here. And then these switchbacks. If you go before April 1st, you can take your own private car into this nine-mile scenic route, which is absolutely gorgeous and breathtaking. Again, that's why this was one of my favorite national parks, because you can actually experience the park. You become part of it instead mm -hmm. of looking down on it, as you do in Bryce. Yeah, so make sure you know where you're going. Uh, back roads are wonderful, but if you have a large week, uh, uh, you know, like an RV or something, always ask the locals to make sure that uh, so you don't get stuck, because sometimes you can even make a U-turn on a road like that. No U-turns, right? <laughs> and they do tell you before you go into the park to mm -hmm. check with the, the people or the park rangers first. Okay. So they can check your size limit. And they have those rules because something happened to somebody or else they wouldn't think of it. Okay. Well, I thought that was the end. We're going to the hoodoos. This is Bryce Canyon, famously known for the hoodoos. And those are the hoodoos. Standing for what? I have no clue. Good question. Depends well, where you live. If you're southerner, a hoodoo is one thing. If you're northerner, a hoodoo is another. Well, here it says it's a pillar of rock, usually in fantastic shape, left by erosions. Okay, so that's the official explanation. And again, this is Bryce Canyon, and this is what they refer to as the natural bridge. So that's nature made. Natural made, yes. No man-made. Okay. Back to the hoodoos. And again, this is looking down. This is um, the experience that you get when you're there at Bryce, that there are no trails that will take you down into the actual canyon like they do on the Grand Canyon or in Zion. This is really the end of the clip now. This is Bryce Canyon. Um, out of the... Um, do you want me to take you to the flyer, the leaflet you can pick up, sure. and I'm going to pan around, and that's what's in the official guide that you can pick up from the rangers. Yeah, the National Park Service and the Department of the Interior gives these maps out when you come into the parks. 
Mm -hmm. And it will talk about the wildlife and the directions. It will give you maps, lookouts, and, and what to I look out for. Them. Yeah, they have what they call a passport book you can purchase, but instead of buying the passport book, I just stamped each one of the little um, brochures or the little flyers as we visited each one of these different national parks. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to go down just a little bit. I want to show you. When I talked about the hoodoos, I was trying to be funny. But it says here, hoodoos cast their spell. Ooh, ooh. That concludes our trip. The insert part of it. Thank you, Lori. Thank you. I am so excited about this show. My, my heart is doing flip flops. Can you believe it? Now that's talking about happy. Interstate uh, 40, is that's what Highway 40 is that you refer to as Highway 40? Correct. Correct. Okay. You talked for a minute. I'm looking for my medicine here. I got it. Bingo. Well, I don't want to have too much to talk about. Uh -huh. I, I talked mostly as far as, as the pictures were being shown. There was a, still a lot of more pictures that we didn't show, but didn't want to bore you too much. It wasn't boring. The, the, I think the reason that we uh, we talked over the, the clips was that we didn't. I didn't know you was going to be in the studio, see. Oh. So that's actually a, a real treat. Yeah. And it made it kind of easy. I, I realized that I used the word fantastic and gorgeous so much, but those are the only words I could use to describe because it was so fascinating and just breathtakingly different from our countryside here. Mm -hmm. And to know that it's just so close to us here in the United States. And it was dates and peanuts. <laughs> yeah. My, my grandson helped me with uh, putting the clip together. And he said, hmm. I said, yep. That's well, we were what it is. <laughs> Peanuts, yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so isn't that cute? Um, and now tell me, how come you went so early in the year? Well, actually, it was late. We were planning on going down in October. Mm -hmm. And then due to health reasons and different things, we decided to wait until spring. And we needed to wait until the, the weather was mm -hmm. just right. And the weather was phenomenal. We had two feet of snow in Flagstaff just several weeks before we got there. And mm -hmm. so... Timing was great everywhere that we went. Oh, that's all I can say, because most of the places would be snowed in otherwise, because this was the month of March. Um, didn't have a lot of wind? Um, to well, but then, pee. Um, but then <laughs> and the wind was in a car, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm really glad that uh, you brought those clips, because mm -hmm. that's an area I don't think I'm going to be able to venture into, not because I'm in an RV, but it's just a little out of the area where I know people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I know we have friends that go to Yuma a lot, but they never, uh, they stay on the main highway and, um, you know, never uh, get out to get interviews, or any, not interviews, um, pictures like that. Yeah. yeah. Well, and actually, I didn't realize that Arizona and Utah was so diverse as far as oh, the yeah. different types of vegetation and rocks, mm -hmm. and you go from one extreme to the next that, um, you can understand when you actually see the Canyonlands, you see the formations and the different um, mm -hmm. um, way that the universe has, or the world has been created. And it's almost like it's pushed up different types of materials out from, from the core of the earth because you're seeing so many different formations instead of just one particular type of rock. Uh, yeah, well, back to what we said earlier is, is you know, uh, some people claim we have such a short history as men. Uh, and you take the na Native Americans, it's talking about the great mystery and the great spirit, and mm -hmm. everything's connected to the, mm -hmm. to the earth, you know. It is. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing the civilizations that have existed before us and the ruins that are left behind where there you can see them, where so much other parts of the world, because of the climate mm -hmm. and the um, weather, that you're not going to see those ruins. They're preserved mm -hmm. down there. And then when you fly over it, I mean, you can see the vast, the distance of that. Mm -hmm. um, that's there, but it's like when I go in, into the canyon, it's different driving over it or actually going into the canyon. Mm -hmm. And there, there was that one shot where you can actually see your footprints. I think you accidentally wandered off into that. Yeah, that was the Hambali ruins. Mm -hmm. I don't think we were 
it's supposed to be there, to be quite honest with you. But mm -hmm. of course, it didn't have keep out signs or any markings. Yeah. So we just voyaged in. We saw it on the map. We thought, well, this would be a good place to stop yeah. and check it out. And that was the same place that we saw the quicksand. Yeah. So. And so when you when you stop and think that uh, the time it took to form these formations and and all the stones you have brought here, and it, you just marvel at them how they can have been created over such a long period of time. Uh, let's talk about Sun Bear for a minute mm -hmm. and why your trip turned out to be a journey. Can we go there for a minute? Sure. Well, I just finished reading a couple of his books, and I'd heard of Spirit Mountain. Didn't know where it actually existed. And so when we came upon the home of the white buffalo and Spirit Mountain, all the, thing, all the time that I was there, this woman is explaining things. And I'm looking up at the mountain. You can actually see the different symbols that are formed in the, the mountain itself. And reading the book, this is where the na actually the Native Americans started going for their spiritual enlightenment. But people from all over the world would fly there. And they would stay out and have their vision quest. They would stay out for three days into the woods. And these were the actual woods and mountains that I read about in the book. And to be there and to stand on the same soil, you could actually feel the energy. And that's the same place where the little chapel was, too, that my mom had experienced such a tremendous energy. So, but to actually be there, witness it, it's so much different. And I would highly recommend every, anybody and everybody to go because it is beautiful. So, so the the piece of driftwood's actually been in the family for a long time. Um, yes, it the might petrified. Be way here, I'm a little unorganized. Here. <laughs> we have some, some challenges here. Yeah, the petrified wood. Actually, most all of this, I have to say, all of it is from my mother-in-law, and she's mm -hmm. collected over the year. Years they um, traveled a lot, and uh, she just told us to take what we wanted. And I was so amazed with the mm -hmm. petrified wood at the time, and then to actually see it. Just laying around just laying there, there like that. Yeah. 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 So, and what's really unique too is that each one of the woods being such a different color. Mm -hmm. That's what I found fascinating is how this one here is so orange. But yeah, you can pick this one up down here. Uh huh. And it you can see how red it is. Mm -hmm. And so. Put the book back where we had it. Yeah. Just in case she needs it down there, that sun bear um, that I had the pleasure of meeting uh, before he passed away. Uh, we were at Ocean Shores together, and he has such a wonderful way of explaining things to a person. Mm -hmm. Very, very good books. Mm -hmm. Very, very good. Uh, had you, had, would you have traveled in the same fashion before you read Sun Bear, you think? Probably, because I didn't know that Spirit Mountain was there even. Mm -hmm. That would just was by happen and by chance. Mm -hmm. So what you say in Spirit Mountain, what's the deciding factor for you? As far as? You, you're making it a journey. Oh, ma oh totally. Oh, yeah. totally. It was definitely a journey. And then also actually seeing things that you've only seen on TV and to mm -hmm. actually be part of Zion, mm -hmm. um, to be part of the different places that people talk about but you never experience. And then to actually go to Spirit Mountain, that's where it started. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, the rest of the time was beautiful. We got to visit family, and that was the main reason that my mother, my father, and my in-laws all lived down in Arizona. So, so instead of just a family visit, it turned out to be a journey. And from what I understand, you had a motorhome at one time, right? We did, mm -hmm. a couple and of you them. you missed all of that in a motorhome? We did. Yeah, that, yeah. Well, and the thing is, is, I wouldn't recommend a lot of these, um, like Zion, I wouldn't recommend going there. Um, yeah. Only because the roads are, are so windy and, and yeah. going into Jerome, into Flagstaff, dropping down into Sedona. Yeah. You know, I'm glad that we traveled the way that we did because yeah. I wouldn't have to worry about losing our brakes. <laughs> well, I burned up mine coming down one of those here not too long ago. Yeah. And it will forever stay in your mind once you come mm -hmm. down and do one of those. Well, actually, that's where my in-laws, they lost their... Um, brakes mm -hmm. and they had to use the trailer brakes in order to actually stop yeah. so it was a very frightening experience it is and yeah. that was again the one um, road that I was showing you mm -hmm. that out of Flagstaff to Sedona and then yeah. into Jerome yeah so. I lost mine in White Mountain uh, Colorado well we lost ours on Donner Pass but that's yeah. whole nother that was a trip that was that not was, a journey, that's not a journey <laughs> no. yeah. yeah so but where was it, well, you know, when, when I burned up my brakes, and I mean, it's like my headset pulled over, and I did, and here was these hikers. The 
it just so happened to climb over the edge of the over the edge of the mountain there and they uh -huh. said lady your brakes are on fire and think of, I mean think of the oh. odds of somebody climbing across the mountain just to make me aware that I wouldn't oh my have gosh. known that. You couldn't smell them or you couldn't tell that you didn't have brakes? No I, I was intensely trying to stop them. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't see nothing, I didn't smell nothing, I just <laughs> thought I didn't feel quite right. Huh. Yeah. yeah. I had brand new brakes put on in, in Olin Cal, Washington and uh, which later turned out they put little bitty brakes on a motor home and wouldn't stop the Mercedes. Yeah. Oh heavens. I had re no recourse because um, they went out of business. Huh. Uh, by the time I got home, yeah, that was pretty bad. And then later on in the year, um, Dunright Auto put a whole new brake system on for me so we could go back into the full drive. That was the year the whole, uh, the whole town chipped in on getting me back on the road. <laughs> Uh, we had a lot of challenges like we do this year, lots mm -hmm. of challenges, and we just got to keep going, you know. And motorhomes are a challenge. Mm -hmm. We had a lot of problems with the motorhome. That's why we don't have a motorhome right now. It's easier for us to travel in the car and stay at hotels, where we go at least. Where you, you know? go, yeah. yeah. Well, you, you see, in my case, uh, I, I need the motorhome because it's cost efficient. I mm -hmm. can't afford. Um, it's time to go already. Would you come back next week since we... Well, certainly. Talking so good here? Sure. You would? Oh, how cool. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Um, we'll see you next week. And uh, I, hope, I hope we feel better next week. And uh, thank you, Lori, for the journey. Uh -huh. Well, thanks for letting me share it with you. Yep, you share it. Yeah. Wow. So, and my ticker. My ticker held out. Huh? So, gee, what an experience. I'm so excited. Just went like, do, 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 do. I have a heart attack. <laughs> Wouldn't that be something? Yeah. Well, I'm, don't think it was in the back of my mind. I, I'm the first <laughs> for concerned. everything. Well, it's not over yet. It's still yeah. going. Now where? Are you feeling better? No. 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 I'm not going to go small.